Today, I'm going to talk to you guys about people and ops. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about, I'm so bad at using these clickers. OK, there we go, influence. And the thing about influence is that we're going to do it a little differently. We're going to have a theme. Because if you think about people who are really convincing, you know, mob bosses and Al Capone, they're kind of people that come to my mind. Of course, in your work, you probably don't want to bring a gang of thugs and some guns. So what I'm really going to talk about is influence without authority. And specifically, like, you know, how can you earn respect? Because you can demand respect, but it's so much better and easier when you've earned it from your coworkers and colleagues. So why do you need influence? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to be a manager or a leader. But you are a leader. And even if you just want to be a technical you know, architect or a senior technologist, it's important that you build your ability to influence and communicate with other people. I mean, you need to be able to get people excited about the projects that you want to work on. And if you have people that you're mentoring or people on your project, you need to make sure that they're involved and you know, really want to work with you on these things. And I think the more senior your role, um, you know, the more important these things are. And maybe you've had an experience uh, like this where you have had this idea for a project or something that you really wanted to work on. And you tried to you know, put a lot of effort into convincing people, but no matter what you did, you couldn't get the time and resources to see it through. This happened to me really early in my career, where I had this idea of a particular feature that I knew would save customer pain and like, help generate less tickets. And so I put together these big PowerPoint decks with all this data, and I talked to all these people, and I talked to them one-on-one, -on -one, and I couldn't, I couldn't get management to give me you know, the resources. I couldn't get buy-off. And this was really frustrating for two reasons. One was that I had this great idea, and I couldn't you know, make it come to life. But the second reason was that I was frustrated in my inability to you know, make something that I knew was right happen. And so, you know, this experience, you know, really helped me decide that this was an area I needed to improve in. And so I spent years, I, I've spent years, and I've had lots of mistakes, and I really focused on trying to build my own influence skills. And I could probably fill, fill hours with everything that I've learned, but I don't have that much time. So what I'm going to do is uh, break it down to three things. And I, I picked these three particular things because I feel like you can go and apply them right now immediately after I'm done speaking, or even maybe while I am speaking, if you're not paying attention. Um, and because you know, I think the world will be better if people can actually hear what you have to say. So let's start with the first one, accountability. If you want to be an influencer, you have to be accountable for what you say and what you do. It is through this accountability that you're going to be able to generate trust and reliability and respect from those around you. Being influential is really about leading by example and holding yourself up to a higher standard. And so I'm actually a little bit embarrassed to tell this story, but I've run it by some folks. They said it was OK. Because you see, when I first became a manager, I believed that success, my success, was defined by my title and the number of people who reported to me, almost like my little empire, if you will. And I actually thought that in my head, which is why I'm embarrassed. Um, and I thought that this was an indication that I was important, right? That I actually had an impact. But then one day, you know, uh, I was at this meeting with a bunch of top-level leaders, people that were very successful in the organization. And we were talking about things that would impact the whole company. And everyone kept looking to this one guy in the room. And I had a lot to say on the topic, because if you know me, I have a lot to say about pretty much everything. And, but no one really cared about what I had to say. And it was at this moment that I realized that there was something special about him, because you see, he didn't have a bunch of direct reports. 
He didn't even have a fancy title. He was just an engineer. But he was influential. And I wasn't. He was important. And I wanted to be important. And so I made it my mission to understand, like, what was it about him that made him influential? And as I got to talk to people and I, you know, kind of explored this, I learned that there was a couple of things that really made him special. So the first one was that he, he was known as someone who could get it done. And it could be organizational, technical, anything. Like, he had good relationships in the whole company of hundreds of people. And the second thing was that he was known as someone who would always follow through on his commitments. If he said he was going to do it, you knew. You could count on him. You knew he was going to do it. And in that way, in my mind, he defined accountability. And you see, trust in an organization and your relationships, it's like a graph. It's not enough to just manage up to your boss and your boss's boss and so forth and manage down to your teammates. You've got to treat everyone you work with with respect. And so no matter who you are, and myself in this bucket, I bet there are ways that you can be more accountable. Accountability is a lot more than just, you know, making sure that you deliver your, you know, work to estimates and hitting your deliverables. Accountability is showing up. It's being present and engaged. It's being on time. This is something I, my mom, when I was growing up, was a waitress. And she used to, in a restaurant, if you're late, it's a really big deal because it pushes work onto other people. And she used to say to me, she said, Katie, because that's what I went by when I was a kid, she said, you know, your being late is a really selfish act. You're telling everyone at my work that your time is more important than theirs. And so, you know, maybe it's just being more on time. I feel like so many tech companies, all the meetings, every meeting is expected to start late. When you add up all that time, I mean, there's a lot of waste. So think about ways that you can be more reliable. Make all your commitments count. Be a person of your word. And so this is your homework for accountability. It's, you have to be a superstar. If all you ever do is what people expect you to do and what you're paid to do, then all you're ever going to get is what you're getting right now. And so you've got to be that person that everyone can rely on to get the job done and to count on and to follow through. So let's go to number two. You guys got that. So everyone knows that you need to you know, be nice to your boss and your teammates to get things done. But, you know, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but a key part of influence is really about how you impact everyone. And these people that you meet, they can be allies in your journey. They, they can be companions in kind of your adventure of life. And there's a lot of key benefits to this. So let me, um, if you don't believe me, let me tell you a quick story. So when I was at Amazon a long time ago, my team managed um, uh, some software that was a dependency for a lot of other teams. And this meant that um, if something went wrong upstream, we were often on the hook. And this one day, I, my phone rang, and I picked it up, and this guy was yelling on the other end. And I started being really defensive and saying, well, it's not my fault, and trying to defend it. And he just got more mad and kept yelling. And so then I took a deep breath and said, OK, this isn't working. So I ended up you know, being nice and saying, let me help you. How can I work with you? And I spent two days debugging a bug in their software. And at the time, I mean, that's actually not the main part of the story. What is the main part of the story is six years later. I interviewed for a CTO position. And after I got the job, the CEO said to me, we knew that you were the person that we had to have. Because it turns out, he was friends with this guy who had yelled at me six years previous. And I can't help but think that, you know, that action that I took then with someone I actually had never met in person at that time, you know, impacted my ability to get a much better salary <laughs> later in life, right? So it's these kind of this ripple effect. And if you think about success in your business or your personal life, the underlying factor in all of it is this friendship factor. 
And you have to invest in relationships to make it present. The world of tech is actually really small. And you never know when one of your coworkers might become your boss, or maybe someone will be asked to provide a reference for you much later uh, when you're looking for that new job. And in this way, you are more influential than you think. So let's do a quick little exercise. I love exercises. <laughs> Take a moment and think about all the courteous people, the friendly people, the people who have made a positive you know, impression on you. Maybe someone held the door open for you or saved you a seat at a table. Or maybe it's bigger things, like a mentor giving you advice on your career, or a colleague helping you with a challenging problem. When these things happen, how do you feel? Chances are, you probably feel better about your day and your world, and maybe these interactions actually make you be a little more courteous and helpful uh, you know, afterwards. Now, I want you to think of all the negative interactions that you've had. Maybe a car cut you off, or a person didn't take the time to acknowledge you or notice you. How do you feel in these situations? I know for me, I can feel annoyed, or small, or mad, or I can go on and on, but I don't feel good. And so, now I want you to turn the tables and think about all the times that you've had a negative or positive influence on the people that you've met. All of us have the ability to influence the people that we encounter. And everyone wants to feel special. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, imagine that everyone is walking around with a big sign around their neck that says, I want to feel special. I know I do. Well, I don't wear the sign, but maybe I should. <laughs> but you know, this, the result is that you actually have a lot of power. And so you need to harness that power. And so I'm giving you another homework. Uh, is that, you know, in this room, I'd put money on the fact that each of you are probably going to cross paths with someone else five to ten years from now. And that means that that person is going to potentially have some influence on you in the future. And so, as you meet people, as you talk to people, if you do one, take away one thing from my talk, it's this, like, make those interactions positive. Be the person that is making the world better for other people. And it will pay off in the long run. So you got that. So now let's talk about reciprocity. Because you can't talk about influence without talking about reciprocity. So what is reciprocity? It's a, you know, a social construct that's kind of deeply ingrained in our society. But it's essentially the, the idea that if you give something to someone, that they will have the sense of obligation towards you. They, they feel you know, indebted to what you've done. And no one likes owing people things. So chances are they might pay you back in this way, maybe in an obvious or not obvious way. And so maybe you've had an experience where this has happened. For me, um, probably the best story uh, for reciprocity was in 2011, I started working with an executive coach. And I had a really like, kind of life-changing experience, and I wanted to share it. And it wasn't really appropriate to put it on my employer's blog, so I put it on my personal blog. And people really you know, resonated with the article that I had written. I normally would have like 100 visitors a month if I was lucky, people I knew, probably my family. And all of a sudden I had thousands, and people were sending me emails and comments. And so this kind of was, it was very, it felt good. So I started writing more. And it became like a game. What could I write that would get people the most excited and engage with me? And I wrote what I knew. Mostly things that I'd screwed up, or mistakes that I made, or lessons I had learned, and things that would help people be better in their careers and their life. And as I started increasing the value of the content that I was writing, something funny happened. I started to get a whole lot of value back. In fact, I, I mean, I got smart, thoughtful comments, but I made connections with brilliant people from all around the world. 
I, I built a strong personal brand that opened doors and job opportunities. And like John said, this is my third time speaking at Velocity. My first time ever public speaking was in 2011 here. And I can't help but think that, you know, part of the reason my proposal got accepted was because it had to do with my blog. And so in this way, my blog and my writing is my currency. But the key to reciprocity is all about providing value. And so, you know, people do things for me because I'm putting my value out there in the world. And so I'd ask you, you know, what is your currency? What do you have that is of value to other people? And how can you share that value in a bigger way? So some of you might be thinking, you know, I don't think I have anything, but you do. Maybe it's a task focus, like you can help someone with your skills or your knowledge and help them, uh, you know, create something that they want to do through your just hard work and effort. Maybe you have uh, people connections and you can help facilitate new relationships. Or maybe you're just kind of funny and nice to be around and you can make, you know, people laugh or provide support in a time of need. I mean, these are all different ways of providing value to the world. And so your final homework assignment is that think about how you can improve the lives of other people. Because if you do, this value is going to come back to you. And so your willingness to kind of contribute this without any sort of expectation of something in return, like, don't worry, I guarantee it will come back. And so as you go through the rest of the conference and you meet someone, don't size them up and think, how can this person help me? Think to yourself, how can I help them? What is the value that I can bring to their life? Because, you see, success is really about people. And if you look around and you think about the most successful people, there's something special about them. They happen to know and are known by the greatest number of other successful people. And so at every turning point in your life when something happens, someone is going to be standing by with advice or support or resources. And the more people that you know and the you know, more valuable those people are, you know, the more successful you're going to be in those moments. And so the trick for you is to think about how do you get these people on your side? How do you enlist them to be partners and comrades in your journey? It's by being someone that they actually want to help. It means that you need to be someone that they see positively, someone who can influence without a gang of thugs or guns or <laughs> the threat of something, but that they want to help you. Because the more influential you are, the more successful you're going to become. So I'll leave you with this thought, which is just to make sure that you always do your best work and you show up. And to treat everyone you meet as if they're a friend or a customer. And give as much as you can all the time. Thank you so much for having me.